the uh, title uh, tries to convey a story, and the story is that uh, until a few months ago, I've only been giving talks called Forecasting Epidemics. And in fact, I, I said very clearly at the, early in the talk that um, I'm only going to talk about forecasting epidemics because I don't believe it's possible to forecast pandemics and that uh, it's irresponsible to do that, to, to, to claim that you can do that, and I'm not going to do that. Well, that kind of changed. Um, so uh, I will talk a little bit about how it changed, um, but my prepared talk um, is mostly about forecasting epidemics. And I will talk a little bit about the difference between epidemics and pandemics. Um, my prepared talk is about um, forecasting epidemics, uh, but I know that um, uh, a lot of interest is on what's going on right now. Uh, so our work as a group has shifted dramatically in the last two months to focus on uh, forecasting pandemics. Uh, but we didn't have time to create beautiful slides for it. So I'm going to um, give a talk with uh, somewhat beautiful slides about forecasting epidemics. I'm going to try to keep it short, and then I'm going to uh, talk with a single slide about what we have been doing about pandemics, a single slide and, and a live website. Um, and then I'm going to um, turn it to you and have you ask questions if you have any. Does that sound like a good plan? Okay. How much, how much time do we have overall? Oh, we have one hour in total, including Q&A. Okay. So I'm going to try to keep the epidemic part to half an hour because uh, it describes methodologies and, and related things that are relevant to the pandemic. Then spend maybe 15 minutes on the pandemic work that uh, the group has been doing in the last um, two months and then uh, maybe leave 15 minutes for Q&A, and I'll try very hard to stick to that. Okay, um, so uh, the Delphi Research Group uh, was created by Ryan Tibshirani and myself um, in 2012, and um, the people you see here are the people who are currently part of the group, but over the years there have been others who are now moved to our alumni page, um, and the people listed here are listed in pretty much in the order they joined the group. So Logan Brooks just defended his thesis in um, computer science department uh, a few weeks ago. Um, well, more like months by now, I don't know. And he's now a postdoc in our group. David Farrow finished his thesis in 2016, I think, moved on to Google, but continued to work with us. Uh, Maria is a PhD student in statistics. Aaron is a PhD student in machine learning. Jin Jing is a PhD student in computational biology. And Brian is a um, DevOps engineer, a staff, a staff person. Um, I used to have to explain a lot why epidemics are important. I don't have to explain it anymore, but this is still a useful um, slide. Uh, what you're seeing here is mortality per 100,000 people per year. And this big spike here is a 1918 pandemic. Um, and the other most interesting aspect of this slide, do you guys see my arrow when I move it on the screen? You do not, okay. So yeah. the other interesting- Oh, yeah, yeah. I, okay, now okay. I can see it. <laughs> is there's actually a rise in mortality uh, in the last 20 years that has to do with uh, bugs um, evading our antibiotics and not enough new antibiotics being in the pipeline for sort of uh, business slash economic slash policy reasons. Uh, so um, uh, uh, epidemics are not a solved problem. Uh, they still kill a lot of people. And pandemics, as you know, now, are not a solved problem at all. And in fact, there will be a pike, spike here. It will not be anywhere near this spike for a variety of reasons. Um, but um, we, will, we, we will be able to see this, this spike here and hopefully it won't be too large. Um, even standard epidemics actually have a significant death toll um, in the world uh, to compare the most singular biggest event, uh, or, a mortal event or morbid, um, sort of a fatal fatality event in the um, 20th century. You can think of the atomic bombing on Hiroshima killed about 100,000 people actually on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki together, including deaths that uh, happened later as, as a result of, of that bombing. Uh, but the single most um, uh, deadly event uh, in the epidemic land will, killed 50 million people. So you can see the relationship here. And even if you talk about an on, ongoing every year 
kind of event. Um, the Syrian civil war is a tragedy that's been going on for 10 years now, and it's been killing on average about 100,000 people a year. Seasonal boring flu run the mill every year um, kills about 250,000 people. Um, and other infectious diseases kill uh, a large number of people as well. Um, what do we know about regular epidemics? Um, uh, what I mean is, what do we know about conventional epidemics, not a pandemic, uh, is that they're regular, but only partially regular. They're not completely regular. Well, obviously, if they were completely regular, uh, we wouldn't need to work so hard on forecasting. Then we would know exactly what's going to happen. And if they were completely chaotic, it would be useless to try to forecast them because they're chaotic. But the reality is somewhere in between, which it makes it uh, a real uh, opportunity to be able to capture the regularity and convert it into meaningful uh, information, actionable information. So what do we know about flu? Uh, we know that it behaves differently in different parts of the world, in the tropics. Uh, it is present year round and it's quite erratic, quite hard to know when it's going to erupt. In the subtropics, so think of places like um, maybe Taiwan, um, maybe slightly further south of there, maybe Ghana, uh, like we're talking about uh, 10 degrees plus uh, north or south, 15 degrees, I don't know exactly where the subtropics end. Um, you get semi-regular behavior, uh, you get one or two epidemics a year uh, at, at more or less predictable parts of the year, although not, not predictable time. In temperate zones, which is where we all live and where most of the world population lives, um, maybe together with the subtropics, uh, you get a much more reliable um, behavior. You get one epidemic every winter, uh, but other than knowing that it's every winter, we actually can say very little about it. It's irregular both in its timing and its intensity. So a flu epidemic can hit in November uh, or it can wait until March and even later. So you have a period of uh, November, December, very much five months, maybe six months, where it can come up any time in that time. Very commonly, it comes in um, uh, February, February, March, maybe sometimes um, January, but there were plenty of years where it came in December and even November. Uh, and intensity also varies quite a bit. You can have a factor of two or three in how uh, intense it is. And we can measure intensity in several ways. One is the peak, how bad the peak is. At the peak of the epidemic, how many people are, are sick? And the second one is what's called the attack rate, which is the area under the curve, namely when the epidemic wave is over, how many people were affected by it. To give you a rough idea of attack rate, uh, regular run-of-the-mill seasonal influenza infects about 10% of the population every year. About, because it changes from year to year, and also because it's very hard to measure. So five to 15% would be a better, better estimate. I'm getting all these Zoom messages. Okay. Um, flu epidemics are very fast, fast moving, but they're not simultaneous. Fast moving means that um, within weeks of their showing up in one place on the globe, they are in most places on the globe. Um, but uh, it's not like they show up everywhere at the same time. Surprisingly, it's still a very open question why, what drives the appearance of flu every year? Why does it come at a particular time of year and not another? Um, you know, there are a variety of answers having to do with climate, um, having to do with uh, the kind of strain that's coming, uh, but all of these answers have problems with them. They don't explain the whole situation. Uh, there are different, very, very different climatic regions in the US, for example, or in other countries. So it doesn't explain why it tends to come to all these places at the same time. Even the very basic question of is it driven by uh, uh, factors intrinsic to the virus or extrinsic and, and uh, depending on the environment. So is it the virus or is it the environment that determines the timing is still debated pretty hotly. Um, so not that much is known about it. And I'll mention a little more briefly about other infectious diseases. Dengue has a completely different, um, different story. Uh, it tends to follow the west, wet season. That part is not surprising because it's a mosquito-borne disease. 
Um, in South America, it usually showed up in the early part of the calendar year. In Southeast Asia, it shows up two seasons a year, a large season, a large wave and a small wave. The intensity of dengue is the most unpredictable and most dramatic aspect relative to flu. Um, I said that flu, a bad year, could be three or four times worse than a good year. In dengue, a bad year could be 50 times worse than a good year. Um, the, the, the variations are much, much larger and much harder to predict. Um, there's a lot more I can say about them, but my guess is you're interested more in the technology that we developed than in epidemiology. I'm happy to talk about epidemiology uh, with the questions and answers section. So uh, why do we think epidemic forecasting is useful? And remember, I'm talking here again about epidemics, not about the pandemics. We'll talk about those later. So what, why is it useful to um, forecast uh, the things that happen every year with some regularity and some irregularity? Uh, well, it's, fo it's useful to a variety of stakeholders. To governments, uh, it is very useful for helping determine um, timing and focus of communication. Um, and one of the most important aspects of communication is vaccination campaigns. Um, so you, we tend to think of CDC as keeping us healthy uh, or designed or meant to help us stay healthy. But really the brunt of the uh, public health work is done locally by local county health departments and state health departments. The important role of the CDC is much more as a coordinator, communicator, um, messenger, um, collector, you know, integrator of information, of course, analyzer and so forth. They, they are not fighting the, the battle on the ground. They're sort of the generals sitting in the headquarters and observing what's happening and putting it all together and then sending messages. And messaging is an incredibly important part of what the CDC does. They have a large apparatus for sending the right message at the right time at the right level. Um, try to get a quote for a newspaper article from them. It takes, you know, multiple layers of approval because they live and die by their communication. So um, for them to know, to get a heads up on what's gonna happen in different parts of the country with flu is extremely important. Uh, knowing it a week earlier means they can uh, mobilize their, their messaging, their, their, their messaging to the public, their messaging to public, to public health officials, the messaging to doctor's offices, to hospital administrators, they, they message, a um, huge number of different stakeholders and each one with its own timing and its own uh, type of message. Um, governments also need to um, decide on their antiviral policies and in extreme cases on closures, extreme as is happening now. In the case of uh, uh, vector-borne diseases, uh, mosquito control is a very important thing for governments to know about. This is because in most uh, vector-borne diseases like dengue, chikungunya, Zika, and, and a few others, there are no effective ways of mitigating or controlling the epidemic except uh, by very in labor-intensive door-to-door campaigns of um, checking on open, uh, open water reservoirs uh, and informing, uh, educating people and asking them to you know, empty water from their puddles or from their discarded uh, uh, tires and so forth. That kind of work cannot be done on a huge city. Um, There's just not enough people to do it. You need to do it in a very pinpointed way. And which is why in dengue, it's important to, to know ab about the specific locations of impending outbreaks. So there's a lot more we can say about that, but governments very much need a heads up uh, and we're going to talk about the kind of heads up, you know, weeks ahead, months ahead, what, what is it that they need, what would they use it for? Healthcare providers, of course, needs a heads up as well. Here, very specifically, they need a few weeks heads up uh, often for uh, helping them shuffle staffing, uh, vacations, canceling elective vacations, canceling elective surgery, uh, prepositioning of equipment. Th these are all things that we, I wrote the slide uh, years ago. Uh, today, everybody knows about equipment, namely ventilator positioning. Everybody knows that elective surgery has been canceled. Uh, but even in non-pandemic, non-crisis situations, in every year, uh, flu epidemics, at the height of the flu epidemic, uh, I think it's 15% of hospital beds are taken by flu patients. And um, if you know something about the health 
healthcare industry, they are operating at close to 100% capacity, um, which is actually a better way of saying it is that their capacity is designed to be fully utilized. Uh, they don't tend to have extra capacity lying around because it's not economically uh, advantageous. Uh, and as a result, they need to play this delicate game of balancing. So if you, if you know you're going to get 15% um, of your beds taken by flu patients in the coming weeks, uh, you start changing other things you do to make room for them. So a few weeks uh, heads up for hospitals is quite useful. And my favorite stakeholder is individuals. Um, so if you have a mother or grandmother who's uh, elderly, 80, 90, and um, maybe still up and around, and um, you know that uh, the flu epidemic is coming to your uh, city in two weeks from now, and she's planning a trip to the mall, or, uh, or even if you know that it's, that it's in, started right now, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and typically we don't know when the flu uh, uh, um, epidemic started, even the flu wave started, even, uh, even once it started. Um, it might be good for you to tell your grandma to maybe stay home and you bring her what she needs. I mean, it's now very clear to us in the pandemic situation, but um, it's true also in regular epidemic situations that there are several weeks a year where the risk of flu is particularly severe. So this is a good time to mention that um, when CDC talks about flu season, it's actually a very vague concept. They're talking about a period from October till April or May. Uh, and all they mean is that the flu wave may come at any time during that time. The actual flu wave is much, much more limited in time. Typically in a period of maybe six to eight weeks, most cases happen. There is um, higher levels of flu uh, outside of this wave during the quote unquote flu season than there is outside the flu season. There's certainly more flu in September than there is in June or July. There is flu in June and July as well. There's flu year round uh, everywhere in the world. Um, but there's more during the winter months. But in addition, there's a very specific wave that is much shorter in time that takes, you know, that is responsible for the majority of cases. And it's that wave that I'm talking about forecasting and, um, and about warning your grandma about. So if your grandma lives in Pittsburgh and her sister lives in Toledo and you know that, and she's planning to go visit her in two weeks from now, and you know that Toledo is gonna get the wave two weeks from now, it will behoove your grandma to stay put because flu can be very deadly to old people. So this is why we established the Delphi Research Group. Uh, our vision is to make ep epidemiological forecasting as useful as weather forecasting is to governments, to healthcare industry, and to other institutions and to the public. Um, I'm mentioning weather forecasting because this has been my inspiration all along. Um, weather forecasting has been around for 160 years, not really in its current format. So it started in the US right after the Civil War. Um, 1860s, 1870s. At the time, I don't think people thought about it as forecasting. They thought about it more as uh, collecting information uh, and maybe making educated guesses. It wasn't until the 40s and 50s and especially the 60s of this uh, 20th century that uh, people started saying, well, maybe we can actually forecast it. Um, and it took a lot of work since then, um, in a, a lot of progress in multiple areas to make it a reality that, that weather forecasting is today. And I, I should mention at least three dimensions of progress. One is, of course, the theory. There's tremendous amounts of mathematical theory and meteorological theory. Uh, interestingly, the work on forecasting led to a huge development in mathematical, pure mathematics theory, and that is chaos theory. All of chaos theory came out of an observation in uh, attempting to do forecasting that uh, and under some circumstances, it seems impossible to do forecasting. The, the, the reality diverges way too fast from the model and trying to understand why that happened led to uh, chaos theory. Um, the second uh, direction where there was uh, progress is a collection of data. Um, we are able to do the kind of weather forecasting we're doing today because there is a grid 
literally a three-dimensional grid all over the planet uh, that covers, you know, er, I think every thousand kilometers or so um, um, to the every thousand kilometer grid. And then there are multiple heights, multiple uh, altitudes of, uh, of reporting. And we have continuous reporting of temperature, humidity, wind direction, wind, wind intensity, and, and perhaps other measures uh, all the time. And our forecasts will not be what they are now if we didn't have that network. And that required a tremendous amount of international co cooperation, um, which was not easy to establish, but that was done. And the whole world is now benefiting from it. And I'm spending time on it because this is exactly what we need for, um, for epidemic and pandemic forecasting. We need this infrastructure of reporting. This is probably the biggest obstacle we have is the data. And the third area where there was uh, progress that um, was critical for epidemic forecasting to become, I'm sorry, for weather forecasting to become a reality is computation. The ability to take the mathematical models and the data and to crunch them together. Uh, and um, weather forecasting has always been a prime consumer of supercomputing. Um, so we are, when we come a hundred years later to try to do for epidemics what was done for weather, in some sense we're already ahead because we have the computation and we do have a good amount of mathematical tools that were developed already, although some need to be developed specifically for this field. Where we are further behind is on the data collection. Back to our group, we are Carnegie Mellon faculty and students and now staff as well from a variety of departments, most of them in the School of Computer Science, but also from statistics. Um, all our code is publicly released as open source. It's a decision we made early on. All our visualization tools are on the web and maybe most importantly, all our forecasts are posted publicly in real time. So I can give a separate talk at some point about the importance of uh, um, forecast of um, how you do forecasting. Uh, the, the most important aspect is you got to make uh, make it public, uh, and you got to post it in an incontrovertible way because otherwise there's a lot of um, possibility for um, you know uh, 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 what's called the drawer bias, where what doesn't work goes to the drawer and what does work gets published. You need uh, and that's known after the fact. So you need, before you, you know how well you've done, you need to commit very publicly to what you've done. And we're very glad that the CDC has adopted that philosophy and has created an exercise starting in 2013, where people submit their forecast to the CDC, where it's uh, documented and then at the end of the season tested against what is known and, and tabulated and accuracy compared and so forth. Uh, epidemic forecasting has finally come of age. Um, give you a brief overview. I won't, I won't go into every detail here, um, except that to say that in 2013, CDC started the competitions. These competitions have grown from seven submissions to close to 40 submissions. That's here. Uh, I don't know if you can see up. Oh, nope. Uh, here. Um, importantly, uh, in 2017, uh, the CDC decided after four years of exercises to, that the technology is mature enough and robust enough and started incorporating it uh, into the regular weekly updates, both to their leadership and to the public on their website. Um, and uh, for, important for us is in 2019, last year, the CDC designated two national centers of flu forecasting, uh, and we, we were chosen to be one of them, to our great delight. The other one is the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, and then the last thing that happened, most recent thing is, of course, the pandemic hit us and changed the world. Uh, types of epidemic forecasting. Um, one type that I'm going to talk about in more detail later is pandemic forecasting, forecasting of an event that's kind of a one of a kind that doesn't have much uh, uh, historical uh, precedence to learn from. Um, the rest of the types I'm going to talk about are uh, applicable to epidemic forecasting. Um, you can try to forecast across seasons, you know, try to figure out what's going to happen next season, what strain is going to be around so you can prepare the vaccine and uh, is going to be an early or late season. We are not doing it currently, and it's very, very hard to do for reasons I can get into in the Q&A. You can do within season, meaning as the season starts, or is it about to start, or while it is starting, what has started already, uh, you can talk about what the rest of the season would look like. And this is what, where we have focused most of our effort in the last seven or eight years. 
And within the within season forecasting, you can do near casting, which is basically a word for uh, forecasting what's gonna happen in the near term in the next few weeks. Uh, now casting has to do with the fact that uh, we don't actually know what is happening right now in a pandemic. So this is something unique to epidemics as opposed to weather. In weather forecasting, you can focus purely on the future because you know what is happening now thanks to the older measurements that the measurement system we have around the globe. And of course, you know what happened yesterday and a week ago and two weeks ago because you measured it then too. So the past and the present are clear. It's the future that you worry about. In epidemiology, unfortunately, the past and the present are not clear. There's a lot of uncertainty. Nobody really knows how many people are infected with flu or any other disease in any given city on any given day. And we're probably never gonna know. We're gonna have a variety of estimates, but we're not gonna know the way we know the temperature and humidity and wind condition. Um, so this picture is designed to emphasize that if, if you think of the y-axis as roughly a measure of uncertainty, Clearly, there's more uncertainty in the future than there is in the past, but it's important to know that there's quite a bit of uncertainty about the situation today and also about the situation in the past. We don't know exactly what happened even a year ago. Um, so now casting refers to try to uh, estimate as accurately as possible the current conditions in any one location. And backcasting talks about uh, uh, trying to understand what happened in the past. And of course, it's important to reduce the uncertainty about the past as an intermediary towards reducing uncertainty about the future. When you forecast epidemics, you have to ask yourself, what are the targets that you're forecasting? If you're trying to quantify it, make it a very quantitative kind of thing, uh, then you have to ask, what are you forecasting? Uh, you can, you can uh, try to forecast the, the season's dominant strain of flu or serotype. You can try to forecast how bad the season's gonna be measured by the season's peak intensity or, uh, or the attack rate I mentioned earlier. You can try to forecast the timing, you can try to forecast locate, uh, duration, or you can focus on just what's gonna happen in the next one to four weeks. When we started working with the C CDC, what they told us is that they wanted us to focus on uh, the last four bullets. So this is within season forecasting of how bad it's gonna be, what is the season intensity, what will be the, when will that worst time come, um, what will be the duration and specifically what will happen in the next four weeks. Um, the duration was at some point dropped. Um, they cared about it less and then was added back. Equally important, you need to determine to decide in advance mathematically how you're gonna measure your accuracy. What does it mean to be accurate? And here it's important to point out that there are actually two kinds of, um, of forecasting that you can engage in. One is uh, point forecasting. Uh, you're trying to give your best guess of what's gonna to happen to any one of these targets. So if the, the answer, if the question you're answering is when will be the peak, the answer is a particular week. What do you believe the peak will be? And if the peak happened a week before, you're still okay. If it happened five weeks before, you're off, right? So you can measure your point prediction by absolute error or squared error. A different kind of prediction is what's called the distributional prediction. We are not trying to give your one best guess, but rather you're trying to assign probabilities to each possible outcome. So instead of saying, I think it's gonna happen in week 17, uh, the peak will happen in week 17, which is in say late April, um, you're saying, no, I think there is this probability that it will happen in, in week 17, but there's this probability will happen in week 16 and 15 and 14. In fact, you put a probability distribution over the entire year. Um, and that's obviously richer, a richer source of information. You can always convert a distribution prediction into a point prediction. Uh, you can give the peak of that distribution or the median or the mean of the distribution, depending on how you're gonna be, met, be scored. But there's a lot more that you're conveying with the distribution prediction because you're conveying not only what you know, but more importantly, what you don't know. You're conveying very clearly how certain you are in the outcome. So you can imagine two different groups, both claiming that the most likely peak most likely a week uh, in which the epidemic will peak would be week 12. So in that regard, they're the same. But one of them says, no, we, we are fairly sure. There's a 90% chance it will happen in week 12. And the other one says, we're not sure at all. There's a 20% chance it will happen in week 12 and it's quite likely to happen in a different week. Which one is right? You don't know until it happens, but they are saying very different things and it's important to hold them to it. To what exactly are you saying? How sure are you in what you're saying? 
And we convinced the CDC early on in 2013 that they should go for the second measure um, so that it's really important when you give your forecast that you also give a measure of your confidence in it. And they accepted that and that is now the norm in uh, pretty much all of their forecasting exercises. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the different methodologies used for uh, epidemic forecasting. Um, the, the most important distinction between the methodologies is between mechanistic and non-mechanistic models. Mechanistic doesn't mean that we treat it as a machine. Uh, it just means that we um, uh, think of the epidemic as a mechanism or we think of the process underlying the epidemic and try to base, uh, to build a model that, um, that is based on our understanding of how epidemics spread. So the first form of mechanistic um, um, explanation is called compartmental models. They've been around for more than 100 years. There's a lot of theory of uh, epidemiology based on compartmental models. They use some oversimplifying assumptions. Um, the, the most famous one is the SIR model, standing for susceptible, infected, and recovered. Uh, there are a whole family of such models with different acronyms. Um, they are very good as tools for understanding epidemics, as tools for teaching epidemics, and they have limited success in forecasting. I'd say very, very limited success because the reality is always much more complicated than these simplified assumptions make. But nonetheless, they're still useful in a variety of ways. A second form of mechanistic is even more extreme mechanistic, is uh, basically simulations which for, uh, sadly, in the field, they're known as agent-based models. I'm saying sadly because as a computer scientist, an agent-based model is something completely different. Uh, and when I bring together people from computer science and from epidemiology, there's confusion to no end about what this means. All they mean in epidemiology is these are simulations at the level of individual people. So literally you build simulations, and I, I participated in, in, in um, designing one such system in, in conjunction with the University of Pittsburgh and the system is still in use there. Um, you, are, you build a simulation of every person in the population that you care about. It could be a city, a state, a country, or the entire world. And people are put into households and uh, households have age structure. They have parents typically, sometimes elderly. They have children. Children go to school. Parents go to work or stay home. Literally, you simulate, it's like the video game sim, I think. Um, and of course, you focus on the features of reality that you think are relevant to the epidemic. So how much time people spend in, at work and what is the rate at which they get infected at work by, by coworkers versus being infected in a, in, at home, uh, parent to child and child to child and so forth. Um, how, how much do people get infected in the community when they go out to the mall or to the street? Um, and this is really the ultimate tool for playing what if games because you could uh, simulate the social distancing. You can simulate partial closure of the economy. You can simulate anything you want. It's just writing more code to, to make uh, the simulation comply with what you're asking. The downside is that you never know if you simulated the right things. Right, you, you never know, you tend to sometimes forget the difference between simulation and reality. And it's very hard to assess whether your simulation is uh, correct, because even if you use it to forecast, um, and if you, it has so many parameters. Typically these simulations have so many parameters in, in the order of many dozens to, to hundreds that um, it's not hard to tune the parameters to fit any data. Uh, so, I'm personally somewhat um, hesitant to use simulations for, for forecasting. They're still very, very helpful for sort of general scenario testing to give us a, um, a sense of um, what's likely to happen if you change this one thing. So qualitatively, I think they're quite good. Quantitatively, they still need to prove themselves. Another big obstacle to the use of simulations is that uh, a large part of what happens in typical epidemics depends on the current um, um, pre-existing immunity in the population. I mentioned that flu affects only about 10% of the population every year. And the reason for that is that almost everybody in the population has some partial immunity to some subset of the strains of flu. Um, 
if we if none of us had any immunity to flu, uh, the first strain of flu that came around would infect a good 60, 70% of us. Um, now, the exact structure of this pre-immunity is very poorly understood and is almost impossible to measure. So a simulation would only be as good as the assumptions it would make about the pre-existing immunity. This tells you that a simulation actually might be quite useful in a pandemic situation where there is no pre-existing immunity. And we will get to that uh, later on. The third type of, um, of approach is the non-mechanistic one, or alternatively call it the statistical machine learning one. And that is the approach that our group has taken. And the approach here is um, to not rely too much on what we think we understand about how epidemics spread and to rely instead much more on historical data. That has been the story of machine learning, right? Listen to the data, not to the stories. Um, so this is the direction uh, we were going because the assumptions we believe don't always hold. Um, and and um, the downside of it is that you need historical data. So it's less suitable for novel, e.g. pandemic situations. And when we get to the pandemic, you'll see that we were really uh, at a quandary what we can do to help because that's not the situation we trained for. I should actually add that um, weather forecasting uses uh, interesting data simulation and numerical integration methods that are now making their way into, into epidemic forecasting too. And they combine uh, uh, some aspects of mechanistic understanding with some data-driven data uh, estimation. So they are kind of a way of marrying mechanistic and non-mechanistic methods together. As usual, I uh, take a lot more time than I intend to, so I'm not going to um, talk shop much. I'm going to skip the technical part. Um, I'm going to show you that it's there. This is just an, a demonstration of one method we used early on uh, for um, our very first epidemic forecasting method. It's an empirical Bayes method. Um, we have since moved on to other methods. We still keep it in the arsenal, but it's not the most accurate one right now. Uh, and what you're seeing on the right here, actually what you're seeing in both is on the left, you're seeing the uh, base uh, interpretation of the method with uh, this beautiful colors are possible trajectories. What you're seeing on the right is the distribution, the distributional forecast that I talked about earlier with regard to a specific target, which is the onset of the epidemic when on what week will the wave uh, start you know kicking up and you can see that as you get close um, move ahead in time uh, the the uh, uncertainty um, reduces until you get to the point where the epidemic actually the wave is starting and then at that point of course your uncertainty is down to almost zero um, i'll skip that i'll skip that um, let me say a few words about now casting. Um, so now casting comes from the fact that um, it is very hard to measure in real time what is happening in epidemiology and that all epidemiology measures are subject to revisions. This is a painful lesson we had to learn over time is that any kind of measure, any kind of surveillance that you do uh, is continuously being revised after the fact, a week later, two weeks later, four weeks later, even six and eight and 10 weeks later, you keep getting revised numbers. So we had to build a system that would treat any data you have as provisional and as having some uncertainty and some bias um, and learn from it. And one of the most useful sources for doing that is digital surveillance. So adding things like um, Google search queries, uh, signals from Twitter, signals from Wikipedia, um, you know, people's accessing Wikipedia entries that are related to flu or to, in our case now, to COVID. People accessing a CDC web pages is also useful information. There are a variety of other sources, as you can see here, and uh, a large part of my work is shopping around for data sources, trying to estimate them, and then spending years trying to convince the lawyers to, to let us have them. Uh, so I mentioned that data, access to data is a, is, is a big, big issue. Um, all of these sources are far from perfect. Uh, they're all noisy, they all have biases. Uh, some of them are, depend on things that have nothing to do with the epidemic intensity and more with, uh, I mean, somewhat with epidemic intensity, but also with the public anxiety. So if the public is upset for some reason because of some news stories, 
Uh, they may search more on the web and they may tweet more and so forth. Uh, so these are all known problems. Uh, what I want to point out as the last part of this talk is that, um, of this segment of the talk, is that there's a way of combining all these noisy estimates uh, to produce a remarkably accurate outcome. So this is a, um, an example of eight different sources of estimates for, for now casting. Remember, now we're talking about now casting. We're talking about every week estimating what's happening that week. So this is over weeks in a particular period. Uh, look how noisy they are. And then let's skip ahead for how we do it. And here it is. And here is our reconstruction. So what you have here in black is the ground truth. This is the signal that the CDC determines well after the end of the flu season, in the end of June, beginning of July. They gather all their data, update everything, and that's their official uh, record of what happened that season. The red is our real-time nowcast, released as soon as a particular week is over. And as you can see, it's an almost exact reconstruction, um, all from very noisy sensors. So that's, um, that's one of the, I think, the, the most important things that we managed to achieve in, in the last few years. I will skip this now. Um, well, this might be a nice slide. So I don't know how many of you read Nate Silver's book. I found it very nice. Uh, if you have, it's a really nice book. Or if you haven't, uh, covering uh, different areas where forecasting has been attempted, different disciplines, and some of them colossal failure, some of them smashing success, some of them somewhere in between, and trying to figure out why. And um, this uh, answer is mine, it's not the book's answer, but I think you would agree with me that the two things that are important for a discipline to um, be able to produce good forecasts is how strong is the theory? Is there a theory? Do you understand what's going on? Uh, and how adequate is the data for grounding the theory estimating parameters? And in one extreme, you have political science where there is really no meaningful theory and no meaningful data. And as a result, there's very famous demonstrations that forecasts in political science are not worth the, the paper they're written on. Uh, and on the other side, you have weather as a big success story. And um, there are chapters in all of these and a few others. And this is where I put epidemiology today. But this, uh, this slide is from five years ago. This is where epidemiology was five years ago. And I think it's already much closer to, to here than, than it was. So I think this aspiration is half, half fulfilled by now. Um, let's talk about pandemics. Uh, I'll try to compress that a little bit and leave some time for Q&A. Um, I mentioned that machine learning methods are at a disadvantage for modeling pandemics because they rely mostly on data and there's almost no training data. What there is in pandemics is a lot of goodwill. So our group of eight or so people has swollen, swollen, swell, swelled uh, in the last uh, month or so to 27, mostly volunteers, faculty, students, staff, uh, we got a lot more volunteer offers than we were able to accommodate. Um, and we formed uh, what we call the Delphi uh, COVID-19 response um, uh, team or task force um, with all these people. I'll show you the picture in a minute. Um, we also found a very different goodwill picture among data providers. It was much, much easier to get data today than it was even two or three months ago. Uh, people understand the importance of this and um, not only the, the CEOs and the people who hold the data uh, are willing to move faster and more aggressively, but even the lawyers, which is really the most time-consuming part of this ordeal of getting data, uh, they're moving amazingly fast and they're trying to find creative solutions. So uh, we were able to accomplish, to acquire data sources in the last few weeks that normally would take us year, literally years to, to take. And at this point, uh, let me first show you our strategy and then show you our website. Our strategy uh, with the pandemic is first of all, to develop indicators for now casting. So remember, before you do forecasting, you have to do now casting. So, and to do now casting, um, the way we do it for flu is by mostly regression. You take a variety of indicators of, of sensors or, or sources of data, and you try to train them by regression to uh, estimate uh, something that will eventually become known. So you collect the data historically and then you train them. Um, in a pandemic situation, A, you can't afford for history 
to, to happen. You can't afford to wait six months to get the real data. And second, even in six months, we will not have the true data. So you're in an unsupervised situation, not a supervised learning situation. You cannot train those indicators. You can just look at them, analyze them, try to make sense of them. Um, there's no ground truth, but we, you can develop indicators, and this is what we have done already. In fact, we finished that stage. We have a milestone this stage yesterday uh, of creating a bunch of indicators. And then the next stage, which uh, we started working on conceptually two months ago, but we're only going to start implementing today, literally today, um, is the forecasting part. Now that we have those indicators as features, uh, we are going to forecast and we're going to focus on a very specific subset of all possible forecasts. We're going to first of all forecast uh, the, our targets, our demands on hospitals, ICU and ventilators. Rather than forecast uh, doctor's visits, which we've done with flu or forecast overall prevalence in the population. And the reason is, as you can guess, these are the bottlenecks of our healthcare system. And this is especially ICU and ventilator use is what's going to drive, or what should drive, decision-making about reopening the economy, about loosening the uh, social distancing or tightening it. We want to stay below the capacity, um, our capacity of ICUs and ventilators, because if we don't, the death rate will shoot way up. So we keep our eyes on the prize, and the prize is ICU and ventilators. This is what we're trying to forecast. The second thing is uh, we have to do it at the local level because this pandemic, like all pandemics, are ultimately local. They spread globally, but they affect things locally. They have different manifestations, different stages, different responses locally. So every region will have to know what is happening to have its own forecast and to make its own decisions on opening or not opening. And the geographic level at which we focus is the level of um, hospital referral regions, indicated here as HRRs. Hospital referral regions are regions that consist of multiple counties. Um, so for example, our region in the Pittsburgh area consists of about 13 counties surrounding Pittsburgh and spills a little bit into Ohio and West Virginia. And what defines this region is that it has one uh, tertiary care center, which is Pittsburgh, where there are hospitals with a large number of ICU beds, large number of ventilators, and most importantly, uh, know-how and, and expertise in using them. Um, we serve as a drawing point for uh, people with COVID complications all over the region. So of course there are hospitals in the other areas, but they're mostly rural, rural counties and their hospitals have very few ICU beds, very few ventilators, and they transfer a lot of the patients to us. So from, from a point of view of planning capacity, you really need to look at these regions rather than at individual counties and rather than states, right? Because Pennsylvania um, is a state, but what's happening in the, in the uh, Philadelphia region is very, very different and requires very different reaction than what's happening in the Pittsburgh region or in other regions of the state. So there are about, I think, 18 uh, hospital referral regions in Pennsylvania and 306 HRRs in the nationwide. And, and our work is on forecasting each one of them. And then the last thing um, is the time horizon. We focus on four weeks ahead. A, because we don't believe that we can do justice to anything beyond that. Uh, we know our techniques are far from tested in pandemic situations. We, we have a, a rough sense of confidence about epidemics, about flu, but not about current pandemic. And also we think that um, people's behavior and government's behavior will dramatically change what would happen. A lot of what would happen in the coming six months, 12 months depends on how we react. And we're not experts at predicting how governments and people react. So um, we are focusing on only four weeks. And we believe that we need to go to four weeks because uh, this is what decision makers need. So when you decide to tighten or loosen um, distance, uh, uh, social distancing, the impact you can expect to have on the epidemic will play out over a period of two to three weeks at least. I mean, you will not see anything for a week and then you will start seeing the impact on symptomaticity and maybe on doctor's visits. And then a week later, you will see the impact on hospitals and maybe three, four days later, the impact on ICUs. So we need to give decision makers a four week heads up uh, to make their decisions because any less than that uh, and they will miss the boat. So this is how we chose at what level we're trying to, to intervene. 
And I will now take you to, um, try to take you to our site that was launched literally yesterday. Do you all see a beautiful uh, map of the United States? Okay, so this is our COVIDcast map. Uh, the website is covidcast.cme.edu. Um, it is done by the Delphi Research Group, and this is the time. If I run out of time, I don't want to stop to not do uh, justice to uh, these wonderful 25 individuals who are actually did all the work in the last uh, four weeks or so, and literally uh, with, uh, with hardly any sleep. This is a real marathon uh, with daily meetings and, um, and working into three, four, five in the morning. Um, here are the, fi the five indicators, COVID indicators that we have in the system now. I should add that there are more in the pipeline, but it takes a bit of work to analyze them and make sure they are automated. Uh, these are updated daily, so there's a fair bit of automation going on behind the scenes of getting them from the data supplier, uh, sanity checking them, doing the processing that we uh, settled on, uh, and then communicating them to the visualization team and visualizing them. Um, I'll go briefly, we have seven minutes left, I'm sorry. I'll try to finish in about two, and, but I encourage you to play with this site and send me your feedback, um, feedback on the interface, feedback on the content, suggestions, we very much uh, welcome that. Um, this is uh, the first indicator, it's doctor's visits. This is the percentage of doctor visits that are due to COVID-like symptoms. Um, you can click on any particular uh, county and see here the, um, the last, two weeks, or if you click on load up to two more weeks, you can load more and more weeks. You can see where the pandemic started. Um, you can have a view at the of county level. You can see that not all counties have their own estimate because of sparseness of data. You can have a view at the metropolitan area level. So these are the major metropolitan areas of the US, and you can have a state level view. For each view, you, you can look at the intensity level with its, um, with its scale. Let's look at New York here. Or you can look at a seven day trend. So this would basically give you which states are in more or less steady state. These are the orange ones, which are getting worse uh, and which are uh, getting better. Uh, I wanna emphasize that any one of these indicators is just what it is. It's an indicator. It has not been proven or shown to be uh, completely indicative of any particular thing you care about. So for example, you, there's no guarantee that the fraction of people who visit doctors with COVID symptoms is completely proportional to the number of people who are infected with COVID, right? There are many, many distortions that can happen along the way. But overall, if you look at all five um, indicators and you compare them, you can see that, that they're very highly correlated. They don't always agree, they certainly don't. But uh, overall, they are in agreement. In fact, they are, have very strong correlation with confirmed cases as reported by other, uh, other groups. So uh, in a paper that we're writing that will be put on the website, you will see the actual correlation numbers and they're quite strong. They vary from you know, 0.4 to 0.8. Uh, so it's quite strong correlations over large periods of time and large number of locations. Um, you may have heard that Facebook has um, um, collaborated with us to put our survey on their main page. Um, this is tremendous. We get 150,000 responses every day from throughout the country and they're expanding it internationally. So this is yet a different indicator, uh, slightly more sparse. There are many more um, counties that don't have their own estimate. In that case, we resort to a global estimate for that state. Google is also uh, running a survey of their own, a much simpler survey, a one question survey. Uh, and it asks about uh, the prevalence of symptoms in the community, uh, whereas Facebook asks, asks about it, uh, uh, about your symptoms in your household. The Google survey is filled by even more people, 600,000 a day. Here's Google. Um, Google search trends, uh, I mentioned we already used it for flu. We had to re-tune re it for tracking COVID signals. I'll move to state so it doesn't take too long to load. And the last one is a uh, flu testing laboratory, or, uh, rather a manufacturer of flu tests that shares statistics about their uh, flu test results. You may wonder why are we looking for flu as a measure for COVID? And the answer is 
COVID testing is still uh, in short supply in many places and it's subject to strong policy decisions that vary from place to place. Whereas just about anybody who's suspected for COVID gets tested for flu uh, as a way of ruling it out. So the number of people being tested for flu, especially that we're out of the flu season now, is a pretty darn good indicator of COVID uh, prevalence in the community. And I will stop here and leave the rest of the time to questions and I apologize for taking longer than I said I would.